Thursday. Thank you so much for spending some of your day with us on Zoom. I am so grateful to be here with some fantastic faculty members from Northwestern. So just a little bit about today. I'm going to be your moderator of sorts for this evening, um, where three of our wonderful faculty members from the Northwestern Center for Synthetic Biology will do a presentation, talk to us a little bit about the work that they are doing. Um, and please put all the questions you have for them in the chat um, on YouTube, and we will try and get to as many as we can at the end of their presentations. So just to start, my name is Simone. I recently graduated from Northwestern in June, where I was not in McCormick, I was in Weinberg, but I actually got a certificate in Weinberg, uh, in McCormick, loved it so much, I stuck around to get my graduate degree in the school studying sustainability and energy, um, and I'm also a graduate director of Northwestern Undergraduate Admissions, so if you have any questions about that, feel free to ask me as well. Um, but now I'm going to turn it over to Danielle to give us a little bit more information on what we're going to be learning today. Hi, everyone. I'm Danielle Tolman Ersek. I hope you can hear me. <laughs> um, I am an associate professor in chemical and biological engineering, but more importantly for right now, I am also a faculty member of the Center for Synthetic Biology here at Northwestern. And we are going to be sharing a video with you. And then um, a, a few of the faculty members, including myself, will talk a little bit about the research opportunities that are available to you um, within McCormick and within our Center for Synthetic Biology that can potentially change the world. So, if you can run that video. I was trained as a physicist, but fascinated with computers. After my PhD, I had my own individual aha moment of, what if we could program biology in much the same way that we do computers by using the rules of physics to do that? As a postdoctoral fellow, we were working on trying to understand how the immune system works, and the field of synthetic biology was in its very early stages. You could build a piece of DNA that when you stuck it into a bacterium, would cause the bacterium to turn on and off in like a rhythmic blinking fashion. I think what's special about synthetic biology is over the course of the last few decades, our ability to reprogram the living world has really accelerated. But then biological systems do so much more. What's so cool about biology is it not only knows how to program, but then biological systems can make stuff like fuels and alcohols, medicines that we use like insulin, and laundry detergent enzymes. Synthetic biology is really about using biology's way of making molecules to make molecules biology never knew about. We've built a community here with many faculty, hundreds of students and researchers that define us as the destination for work and research and study in synthetic biology. My lab focuses on the cell membrane, the structure that surrounds every single living organism. And what we're able to do is actually build the cell membrane in our laboratory from scratch. In my lab, one of the applications we're most interested in is using this idea of a cell-based device to treat cancer by coaxing the immune system to recognize a tumor and remove it safely from the body. I have a brand new collaboration to use biology to help degrade plastics. We want to eventually be creating plastics that are degradable on command. We've been studying for a long time how molecules sense their environment. What we figured out how to do is take lead sensing molecules out of the bacteria and put them in a test tube. So now someone that wants to sense for lead can dip this piece of paper in their water and they see the spot. I think we're kind of at this tipping point in the field of synthetic biology. It's gonna impact us in our lifetime, right? And it's not gonna be in 20 years or 40 years or 100 years, but it's starting today. Okay, thank you for that. I'm gonna now share uh, a little bit more information about synthetic biology and our center. Uh, hopefully I'm sharing the correct screen for you all. All right. Uh, synthetic biology has all the potential you just saw, uh, but I, if I can advance the slide. Um, if I could convey one thing, it's the fact that it's going to have impact sooner rather than later and that you can be a part of that 
um, from the moment that you you walk into the lab, which is when you walk into the door at Northwestern. And so Josh Leonard, Neha Kamath, and I will be sharing some examples, but this is by no means comprehensive about what you might be able to do. Okay, so uh, as you just saw, engineered biology is actually all around us. Um, you heard this, it can be in the form of the gasoline you're putting in uh, the gas tank of your car, um, which includes components that are made from microbes from renewable sources. Of course, medicines and right now, um, beyond even insulin, all of the different uh, diagnostics and vaccines that are coming out for COVID are a great example of engineered biology. And then even every time you wash your clothes, if you're using any of the uh, sort of name brand detergents, they all now have enzymes in them to help break down the stains. And so those enzymes are actually engineered biological parts that already existed that were able to degrade some of those uh, compounds like oils and um, wine, grass stains, things like that. And the reason that synthetic biology is really taking off sort of follows what information we've had made available to us over the past couple of decades. And so you can sort of see the, as the different eras of the past couple centuries go by, you can see mechanical leading to railroad and steam engine. You can see um, the electrical and internal combustion engines come out. Um, then you see petrochemicals come out. Now we're then uh, now in this electronic and information age. And that has powered, that's actually directly leading in, just as all those others kind of lead into one another, this uh, ability to gain massive amounts of information has really allowed us to explore the biological realm and to begin to engineer it in a way that wasn't possible um, even 30 years ago. And this will impact food, energy, chemicals, materials, and medicine. So a lot of people think first of medicine when you think of biology, but it'll actually pretty much impact every aspect of society. And so anything that you're interested in doing is probably something that can be done in the future with biology, which is really exciting. Uh, so what does synthetic biology do or what does engineering biology do? We're really using technology to control and use living systems or their parts. And these are a few of the many examples of the, the types of organisms or pieces um, from these organisms that we can use to do some very interesting science. So the alien-like things over here are actually viruses that infect uh, bacteria. It's representative of some of the systems that we study in our lab because that can be used to remodel your gut to prevent you from getting some of the intestinal diseases, but it can also be used to develop a vaccine scaffold for, um, for COVID or any other um, maybe bacterial infection or other viral infections. Um, but you can also imagine engineering plants, fungi, um, yeast. So all the, the wonderful things that we've known yeast can do for millennia. We now have even more uses for their different pieces and so on. So to do this, we have to reprogram and rewrite the genetic code. And uh, so that means it all comes down to DNA. Hopefully you all have heard about the Nobel Prize going to uh, two really phenomenal scientists um, who invented, so to speak, a way of using CRISPR-Cas systems to do genome editing. Um, so that's one example of a way that we can play with that DNA, but there's actually a lot of other methods that we use as well. Uh, the key then is to know what to change in the DNA, right? So DNA is actually four, four bases, more or less, unless you're using a very exotic system <laughs> that you've created yourself. And um, that is very analogous to in computers having the ones and zeros, but it's actually a lot more powerful because it is atoms and they can be used to build things. Right? So um, it, it leads to not just um, binary information, but an um, analog scale of different things that you can do. And that's what really gives us the power to do everything that we've been alluding to. Okay, so I showed this a little bit earlier in a different form. We're basically in the next industrial revolution, the fifth one, which is the biological one. And the 
the question you may be asking is why don't we already have all those things? What is there left to do if you've figured out how to manipulate DNA and um, we have all the information now from um, the, the computational world? Um, so the problem is still that biology is really complex. So we have all the information there, but we still have to figure out what it all means so that we can use that to reprogram. And so one example is you can get you know, many different types of substances um, from seemingly the same encoding information. Well, why would you get those different materials from the same coding information? Well, it's not just the DNA, it's when it's turned on, it's how it's used, it's where it's located. Um, and inside cells is actually just an amazing bustling world. It's like looking down on a city. It's, there's so many moving parts and different pieces. And, and so we know what's encoded within there, but we don't know when, why, and how all of those things are there yet. So by no means do we know how everything works in life. There's a lot of unforeseen interference, things that we haven't tracked down. And a really big additional problem is that cells have their own objectives. They, um, they do the things that keep them alive because that's what nature has evolved them to do. That's been the one criteria is to survive. And so we sometimes put in instructions that would conflict with that. Well, we won't get the response that we're quite expecting. So even if we're trying to grow a bacteria to make a biofuel, um, we have to do it in such a way that the bacteria still stay alive. Okay. Um, a second set of problems, not on the you know, science side, but on the logistical side is uh, is it cost effective to use biology to solve this problem? Uh, is it worth the money that we're going to put into it to get to the point where it's cost effective? And how fast can we do that? Are other solutions going to be faster? And um, so this has been a challenge for a long time. And it's something that the computer revolution really has enabled us to start to compete on these more logistical questions of cost and risk and speed. Because if we have a lot fewer man hours devoted to solving a problem because of the help of computational power, then that, that will make some of this more feasible than it used to be too. Uh, so a couple of examples are these chemicals, um, which are the targets shown here. And so you may not be familiar with these as names of chemicals, um, but Almost certainly you've touched in your lifetime things that are made from 1,3-propanediol. Examples are carpet fibers are made from um, downstream processing of this chemical. Artemisinin is actually a precursor to an anti-malarial uh, treatment um, drug. So it's kind of the last main piece that you'd wanna make. And farnesine is a precursor to a lot of compounds that are found in things like uh, cosmetics, perfumes. And each of those could be made in a more renewable way now using biology uh, than in the past, which was primarily derived from either uh, a non-sustainable source such as petroleum or some very difficult to harvest plants um, that only grow in particular regions of the world. And so you can't really scale them up. So um, synthetic biology, has these as success stories. It worked, we were able to make these in sustainable ways using biological pieces. But you look at the time it took to do so and it started out uh, pretty terrible, right? 15 years, 13 years, hundreds of, of um, personnel years working on these projects. But we're getting better as, as we move along in the timeline and that is enabled by this uh, computer res revolution, uh, AI, machine learning is going to continue to enhance that trajectory. So it's a really exciting time to get into it because we're now at the point where you're going to be able to see products that you could work on as an undergrad get out there uh, in the real world um, right around the time you're graduating. That would be feasible. Uh, so synthetic biology offers solutions from the form of new engineering principles um, and also methods uh, from the computational side for programming. And so you can really work, if you like to work at a computer, you could be working on these problems at a computer. If you wanna work in a lab and get experience working at a bench, solving real world problems, you can do it that way too. And all of those will feed into uh, the synthetic biology progress that we're making. So here's our group. Um, the, the current uh, faculty of the Center for Synthetic Biology, we are growing every year. So more and more faces will be added to this slide year after year. 
Um, but there is a large number of us now, and we all work on different aspects of the biological world and on different applications. So you might be interested more in medicine, or you might be interested in sustainable uh, chemical production or recycling, or maybe using plants. All of those are possible. You want to do something computational or um, at the bench. Again, all of those are possible working with the people that you see on this slide. Um, this is a couple of years old now. Obviously, we couldn't take a picture like this this year, um, but our our group is growing. This is a lot of the researchers, not even all of the researchers in the labs of the folks on the previous slide. And you can see we're a pretty diverse group. Everyone has different interests and um, we just have a shared goal of using biology to try to save the world. Okay, so that's my spiel about how awesome synthetic biology is. Hopefully you are inspired and um, maybe want to reach out to us to talk to any one of us on that slide. We'd be happy to talk to you more about it. Um, but now I want to shift gears just for a couple of minutes because I think I'm almost at my time limit and say what I do in my research lab to give you a concrete example. And then I'll turn it over to Josh Leonard and Neha Kamat to talk about their work. So I work at problems related to the interface of biological systems and their surroundings, or even with non-biological systems. And that means working at membranes and interfaces. So I do work with Neha, if you saw that in the, in the video, that's, um, she works on membranes as well. I work on the pieces within them and trying to figure out how to get things across them or to stay inside. And the reason I do that is because spatial organization, we know matters in nature. Cells have organelles. Organisms have things like organs or tissues. And even if you look at communities made up of lots of different organisms, each in each of these cases, if you took away one of those pieces, if you took away an organism from a community or you took away an organ from an organism, the whole thing would fall apart, right? It would, the, the system would collapse, the organism would, or cell would die. And so we know this is important and it's something that we think we should be taking advantage of when designing engineered biological systems uh, to do some of the sustainable or medical or diagnostic uh, sorts of applications. So we work with organelles and bacteria. Bacteria aren't supposed to have organelles, but they do. And we're trying to engineer them to help us with our um, goals of making sustainable chemicals from non-petroleum sources. We work with virus-like particles to control what can be shown on the surface and what can be protected inside of the the virus-like particle so that we can develop new therapeutic or diagnostic or even vaccine scaffolds. And we use bacterial secretion systems. So there's systems that sit in the membranes of bacteria and secrete out actually normally toxins that may make you sick. And we're working on seeing if we can have them instead secrete cancer therapeutics into a tumor um, because the bacteria already naturally um, congregate near, near tumors. And so um, we are looking at problems like this again, touching medicine and sustainable chemical production. Um, and with that, I want to turn it over because I'm way over time <laughs> to, I think Josh Leonard will be next to talk about some of the things that he's doing in his lab. Great. Thanks, Danielle. Okay, super. So hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I'm Josh Leonard, as Danielle said. I'm also a professor in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering, um, along with Danielle. And so to build on some of the points that were nicely made in the video and Danielle's introduction, um, and hopefully make some of these really big picture applications, something you can imagine, uh, I decided to tell a brief story about some work that my group and our colleagues are doing to transform how we conceive and build new medicines, but by bringing in some of the tools that you will learn as an engineer at Northwestern, and in that way, really bringing true engineering design into the development of new therapies. So as the video and Danielle mentioned, the, the real shared goal of everyone in synthetic biology is to transform biology into a system that can be truly engineered. So, so what does that mean? It means like anything else that you imagine as an engineered material, we'd like to be able to start by conceiving a desired function then have the understanding needed to translate that goal into a design, then be able to build that design and have it work as predicted. So we can do this with something like an electronic system or an electronic kit like you see here. 
uh, because decades of research and knowledge, for example, from physics and electrical science have been boiled down in this case into parts and they can be interconnected to create customizable, predictable behaviors. And at that point, you don't even have to know what's going on inside the parts. You just need to have some understanding about how to use them and how to do design with them. So the question is, how do we do that with living cells? How do we start by specifying a goal? Um, what are the parts? And can we really ever get to this level of sophistication that nature has built in this case to enable this immune cell to chase this bacterium around? Um, how do you ever break that down into something that sounds like uh, an engineering problem? So this is a corner of synthetic biology that we call engineered cell-based therapies. And the expanding field of that mammalian synthetic biology is, is already pursuing this goal in the context of cell-based therapies that carry out sophisticated functions um, that really we cannot do right now with even the most advanced drugs and uh, drug delivery technologies. So right now in the clinic and, and trials, there are uh, technologies being used in people for applications like on-demand synthesis of drugs inside of patients, promoting wound healing, tissue regeneration, programming stem cells, and causing them to adapt useful and um, specific roles, and probably none more so than in an area that is a focus of much of our research, the treatment of cancer using this approach. So many of you might've heard about this in the news at this point. Um, this is the promise of cancer immune therapy, or in other words, harnessing the immune system to treat cancer. Uh, and really you might've heard about it because it's being successfully applied to a growing pool of patients in clinics and in biotechnology companies as well. Uh, so just to kind of set a frame for how this works, I'll, I'll just briefly explain a bit of how it works. Um, it, when, you, when you treat a person with this approach, you first start by taking some of their blood through a blood draw, then you take an engineered piece of DNA, put that into those patient cells. And after you've done that, the cells go back into the patient. And when the cells express that DNA that you inserted, it causes those immune cells to express a gene, which encodes for a protein, uh, which is called an engineered receptor. And that really lets those engineered cells specifically recognize tumor cells and then become activated in killing those cells and, and only those cells inside the patient. And so excitingly, this has led to an increasing number of true cures for cancer. Uh, for patients, including Emma Whitehead, who's the literal poster child for this, she was treated uh, almost a decade ago now for, uh, for a cancer that um, physicians couldn't treat with existing approaches. And she's uh, nearly, a de nearly a decade now uh, cancer free after participating in this approach. Now this is great. And there are a lot of people who will be benefited already by what we can do today. But there are some important limitations that my story was meant to introduce. And the big one is that this works best when you know specifically what to look for on the surface of a cancer cell. And it just turns out some cancers don't have something specific on their surface. And in general, other cancers can evolve during the course of treatment to remove those markers that are recognized by the therapy. So this is a gap that really applies to the majority of cancer patients. And a big challenge then is how do we take this clear promise and make it work for those patients? And addressing that's a really great example of illustrating how synthetic biology can uniquely help us plug some of those gaps. The good news is in general, and this is something I learned really through my training, physicians and scientists generally have a bunch of good ideas from the clinic and from frontal research as to what they wish or, or know a therapy needs to do, but they really lack the technology needed to manifest that strategy. That's where engineers come in. And so for example, we know that if you could inject immune potentiating factors right into tumors, then the resident immune cells could become activated and clear many cancers. We just can't do that because injecting activators into the blood isn't something that, that we can do practically. It's too dangerous if it's gonna be going all over your body. And uh, sometimes those kind of activators can't even get into the tumor. So if you could find all the little tumors in a patient who really needs this approach, it would work, but we have no way of directing that known function to those spots. So that's a design challenge for which we can pose a design solution. And in this case, when we're investigating is, well, what if we could engineer a cell to go all around the body, sense the chemical features of a tumor, or in other words, figure out whether or not it's sitting next to a tumor using something that doesn't rely upon a unique molecular um, feature on the surface, but something more general across all the cancers that occur in different patients, you'd have a therapy that could then deliver that activating agent in hypothetically all kinds of cancers. And so how do we do that? How do we implement a goal like this? 
And that's where we take the synthetic biology approach. And really what you learn in engineering in general is that doing fancy things means breaking a complex goal or problem down into a series of manageable steps. Um, in this case, you break that down into sensing, processing, and actuation. And so with some knowledge of how biology works, um, you can come up with some idea for how a design that carries out a goal, like I said, might look. Then we need to figure out how to build the pieces of DNA that encode that design. Um, some of that work does involve building new biological parts, which we can mix and match to implement new programs. So again, drawing back to this analogy of the electronic kit, a big part of what my lab does is build those parts that at some point will be used to put together new functions, both ones we're thinking about and importantly stuff that we haven't imagined, but other folks might want to do. Um, what really makes this design driven engineering, um, engineering and not just tinkering is that we increasingly also use mathematical models, really the same type that you'll learn about, learn about in your first or second years as an engineer at Northwestern and computational simulations, which again, are tools you use as an undergraduate. Um, and then what you can do is simulate many possible things before you build any of them. What it really lets you do is focus in on the most promising designs. And when things don't work as expected, it lets you zero in on the problem, learn something more about it and get better every time. And so this emerging paradigm of using design in engineering is no longer a fantasy. It's something that we actually can do pretty well right now. So I'll leave that as a cliffhanger and just say, if you'd like to learn more about our work, please feel free to visit our website, or I think more interestingly, follow us on Twitter where we do some live updates including some stories that I alluded to just then. Um, and I have finally just end by saying that um, nearly all of our work, including the papers I was talking about, involves undergraduates from many majors who are essential parts of the research team. And so with that, I'll thank you for your time and uh, feel free to take any questions later. Well, now I'm gonna hand it off to my colleague, Neha Kamat. Hi everyone. Uh, I am Neha Kamath, and I am an assistant professor in the biomedical engineering department. Um, and if you become a BME major, you will also have me for thermo your sophomore year. So I'll see you then. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work our, my group has been doing also in the synthetic biology space. Um, and that has been approaching the idea of engineering cells from a different angle. And that is, can we take living parts or parts that come from living cells and try to build something from the ground up that looks lifelike. Um, and one of the reasons that um, we might do this first is that cells perform a variety of really um, complex and amazing tasks from dividing their membranes to moving, to talking to one another, to transporting molecules in and out um, of, their, of their systems, to actually synthesizing molecules from scratch. And so by trying to recreate some of these behaviors in the laboratory, um, just by assembling different parts together, uh, one of our goals is to understand the fundamental principles that drive these processes. Um, and so really understand biology by building it from the ground up. Another goal of ours um, by building um, cell-like systems is to design a, a particle, a nanoparticle that um, we have, can have a lot of control over. Um, so, Danielle and Josh alluded to these um, sometimes problems that come up where living systems um, have their own agenda. And so what if we could build something that does exactly what we want it to do? Maybe it'll hold a toxic compound like a chemotherapeutic drug um, and we don't have to worry about keeping the cell alive. Um, or maybe we can execute really complex signals um, to design new types of sensors and design systems that can sense molecules that um, living cells are not able to. Um, and the caveat here is that we're really at a much more foundational stage. Our, um, when it comes to engineering, a long way to go. Okay, so how do we build a cell? Um, in my lab, what we think about doing is starting with a cell membrane. And we can think about this as sort of a, a scaffold. So if you're going to build a car, you might start by um, building the body before you even think about putting the engine and the gears inside. And so in a similar way, the cell membrane is this container and it holds all the guts of the cell, 
um, but it also plays a really important role in a lot of processes. It has different membrane proteins, um, it facilitates transport and signaling, um, and it can undergo a variety of shape changes. So we in our lab start with this beautiful structure that's found in every single living organism and we build it. And it's actually fairly straightforward to do. Um, so if you take the parts of a cell, the lipids, and you toss it into water, it'll spontaneously self-assemble into a bilayer structure shown on the, on the left here. Um, and we can make that membrane with a lot of different components, things that you find in real cells and things that you actually would never find in a real cell, but that can enhance the stability or make it pH responsive um, or make it light responsive. So we can sort of Frankenstein up these, these membranes. Um, the other thing we'll do is we'll take the actual guts of a real cell um, we call these cell-free protein expression components. Um, they can consist of a gene, uh, ribosomes, tRNA, nucleotide triphosphates, the things you need to actually make proteins, and we can embed them inside our vesicle. And, and now we have sort of the parts that you would need in a cell, but with highly programmability. Um, and so using this, um, these, these artificial cell-like systems, there are two things we do. We can build biosensors, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And we can also try to think about building systems that control cellular behaviors. Um, so this is one example um, of a type of, of device that we've thought about making with vesicles. Um, we were thinking about how to make a vesicle that can sense um, a fatty acid molecule. These are membrane associating molecules that might build up near the sites of tumors or near atherosclerotic plaques. And what we thought about was designing a vesicle that um, when it sensed this fatty acid molecule, um, that molecule would integrate into the membrane and it would trigger the assembly of a pore forming protein shown in blue here. And so what might happen is um, in the absence of that, por that fatty acid, these pore forming proteins sort of exist in a disassembled state. But as soon as that fatty acid is sensed and integrated, the pore forming protein assembles. And so then what you might think about doing is encapsulating something inside this membrane. Um, maybe it's a drug. Um, in this case, we just have a dye. And so when that molecule is sensed and it goes into the membrane, the pore forming protein assembles and you can release something else inside your vesicle um, right at the site of where you sense this molecule. So this is kind of how we think about putting parts together in careful ways to um, design, in this case, a sensor. So um, another idea that we've been thinking about um, using artificial cells for is designing um, biosensors that can move in complex environments, for example, our bloodstream. So you might think about the fact that we have a variety of different biomarkers for our health that are really hard to access. Um, so I think a lot about pH. There are low pHs near the sites of um, tumor cells, but if you take a blood draw or you take a urine draw, it's really hard to detect a low pH that might have existed in a very localized part. Um, and so if we design particles, and maybe we can even design living cells um, using Josh's technology that can travel through our body and see things, and in response to seeing things generate some sort of signal, then we can collect these vesicles and look at them and say, where have you been? And did you notice something that indicates a really significant problem? And so that's a, a problem um, that we're also trying to address with these artificial cells. So with that, um, those are just some examples of the things we're working on. Um, this is my group and I have highlighted some of our um, undergrads, our amazing undergrads, two of which Anna and Lucas will talk to you a little bit more after this. Thank you all so much. Um, we do have one question um, and a little bit of time left. So I wanna see if we can get to this one question and I will pose it to the three of you. And if any one of you has any um, response, please unmute yourself and go ahead. So our question from the audience is, it was really exciting to see Northwestern's iGEM projects at the 2019 Jamboree. Will Northwestern be continuing with iGEM in the future? Asking because this person did not see Northwestern compete this year. I can jump on that one. That's a great, yeah. So I was the director of the iGEM team. We launched it in 2009, I think. And yeah, we ended up taking a pause um, this year in, in part for a couple of reasons. Um, there's a lot of synthetic biology undergraduate research available at Northwestern, like so much available at Northwestern. And so one thing that we asked our undergraduates with this iGEM uh, idea was, you know, what's the right mix of how to do iGEM with research and things like that. And we got a lot of really good ideas there. But with that and the pandemic also coming along, um, 
uh, later on, uh, we decided that we're going to do a, um, a, a, a down year this year to do some planning around that. So I think if anybody ever wanted to do it, it's pushing out an open door. There's tons of support for it. We're all very enthusiastic. I think that what you'll find here is uh, a general thing you're going to find about Northwestern. There's so many cool things you can do that what we want to do is support you in the thing you most want to spend your time on. That more than anything has been um, uh, a motivator for just taking a year to examine how to best serve undergraduate interests in Synbio. Well, that's the perfect lead into the final question. I want to sneak this last one in. Danielle, do you mind speaking really quickly to um, the extent to which students can explore their own research questions within the field of synthetic biology? I think Danielle had to pop off. So would it be okay if Neha took a crack at that one? Of course. Um, yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, so I think um, there are actually a tremendous number of opportunities to explore your own questions. And what I would suggest is um, taking a look at first the, the faculty in SynBio and seeing who might be doing something that aligns most with your interest, um, getting involved and letting them first train you. They'll give you a project, um, a mentor to work with, and then pitch that idea is, is what I would say. So get your hands in, um, in the work a little bit, learn a little bit, and we're always really excited. And our goal is actually for undergrads to independently take up their project on projects. Amazing. Thank you so much. I wish we had some more time for questions, but if you look up Northwestern Center for Synthetic Biology, you can definitely contact everyone involved if you have any more specific questions. Um, for everyone else watching, Northwestern has great resources on their YouTube channel. So if you look up Northwestern Admissions where this is airing, you can find different panels of students and other information sessions if you have any other questions. And additionally, we do have for McCormick Week, um, another event coming up right after this that I'll be mo uh, moderating as well. It's going to be a little bit about student research in McCormick, so please feel free to hop on that. Mauricio put a link in the um, chat, so feel free to sign up if you'd like to join us for that. Otherwise, thank you all so much. Have a great evening and go.